Well, good morning, everyone. Bob Ravenscroft, the Vice President for Advancement here. Yesterday was quite a day for us. Um, just a little bit on vaccinations. We are continuing them today, and we're working through the priority uh, allocation that we, we shared previously, and we'll continue to do that as additional allocations arrive. Information specific to members of the media, we have John Woodrich, the CEO of Bryan Medical Center here. He's not presenting, but he's available for, for questions if you have any. And after the presentation of the daily stats, we're so thrilled to have Dr. Kevin uh, Richmuth here. He is the state surgeon for the Nebraska Army National Guard. He's also one of our pulmonologists here, and in his private practice, uh, serves Link all of the Lincoln hospitals. Clearly services in his blood from the profession he chose and then his service. What he's going to do is uh, address some of the prevalent questions that are coming in about uh, vaccination. He has shared this with the enlisted men and women of the Nebraska National Guard, and we're fortunate he's sharing it with us today. <clears throat> After that, we'll open it up to questions. At the conclusion of questions, we have a short video. Uh, members of the media, you're, you're very welcome to stay in and stay on and watch that. It's primarily for um, our employees and the public that tune into these. And the images used in it are all of the footage that we provided to you in the media yesterday. But please feel free to stay on. Um, the current trajectory of, of our COVID patients really remains encouraging. Um, I looked it up and we are at our lowest mark since the sometime between the 2nd of November and the 3rd of November. So I know, as we've said, taking premature victory laps is not advisable, but our community and state has really heeded some of the urgent pleas uh, throughout November. And we are incredibly grateful for people for doing that. So everyone keep up the good work. Uh, regarding the statistics, um, there, we're gonna pull up some charts that members of the media, you'll get the full release as you say, but look to the right hand side of the chart. What you can see is our midnight census was 497 patients. Of that, we have 66 patients that are COVID positive, another 11 that are uh, no longer infectious, but still hospitalized. So as you can see, and if you add that up, there are 77 uh, COVID related patients in our care. Um, of them, 14 of them are in the ICU and 10 of them are currently ventilated. Um, as you can see from the map that will appear on here, we are now uh, seeing and continue to see more patients from Lancaster County than we do from greater Nebraska. Uh, that has been somewhat of a, somewhat of a change. And then on the next, next slide, you can really see why this has been such a trying time for us here and for hospitals across the country, certainly in Nebraska. Um, you know, we're at the far end of that. And, uh, you know, as we come down this curve, we, we hope this uh, diminishes, but in our fingers are crossed that we don't go back up, but you can see we all have our hands full uh, here as well. Again, full stats will be um, presented to members of the media uh, from Brad as we always do. With that, it is my pleasure to uh, invite to the podium, Dr. Kevin Richmuth. Well, thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, first off, I really want to start off by uh, thanking the Brian uh, leadership, the Brian team, all of the Brian staff. Um, it, it's just been uh, frankly inspiring uh, with uh, how well uh, they've done and, and how well they've worked together with the, with the community and taken it upon themselves to really, you know, push home some, some important uh, messages. And it, as uh, Bob had talked, uh, brought up, I don't think it's any you know, small accident that we're seeing these uh, numbers go down. And so you know, with that, uh, you know, any message has to be heeded. And so what I'd like to do is thank the members of our uh, community. Clearly enough people are following this messaging because this doesn't happen by accident. There isn't some magical thing this virus does. This is uh, people doing the right things, enough people doing the right things to bend that curve. Uh, and with that, definitely is not the time to get complacent or uh, change what we're doing because uh, there is a lot of excitement, uh, as I'll talk about with this uh, virus or with this uh, vaccination. Um, but uh, as I've told a lot of people, uh, to me, I think it is the beginning of the end. I think it is a light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel's still long before we reach the point where we'll have enough people vaccinated to truly have that make, make the biggest difference. Um, and so 
I did uh, follow example and I got my vaccination yesterday. Uh, again, commend Brian as part of the vaccination planning team and they just did uh, we, uh, such an amazing job. Uh, employee health, um, it was so, and, and it's happening down the hall here in the conference center for a lot of the staff, very smooth, very safe, very efficient. Uh, and I have to say, I wouldn't even know I had anything done. Um, I don't have any symptoms. Got up and exercised like I normally do this, uh, this morning uh, and uh, uh, really uh, nothing, uh, nothing at all concerning uh, and I feel very confident in it. So, um, so what I'd like to do is just kind of go through this, the vaccination, you know, getting the EUA last week, you know, uh, rapidly being pushed out and administered so quickly is another um, thing we can be uh, proud of as a, as a country and a community that, uh, that this was all able to, to happen and, and uh, here at uh, in Lincoln, you know, being one of the first uh, groups of uh, healthcare workers to get, to get vaccinated. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about that because there's a lot of questions. There's gonna be a, you know, a lot we need to educate and re-educate on with regards to this. And sometimes I take for granted, I feel like I've been involved with this uh, for, for so long, including tracking the vaccination you know, progress and development and, and having the privilege of being in various meetings and hearing uh, details on this that uh, you, you, you kind of say, well, how can anybody you know, question this? Uh, you you kind of take for granted that a lot of people don't know what, what I know about this. So I wanna try to embark and, and put some of that confidence uh, into this. Um, so on this first slide, you know, one of the big questions is about mRNA vaccinations. And so those are the first, we've got the Pfizer one that came out. We've got the uh, Moderna one to go to FDA review. Uh, Thursday, uh, likely to be approved, uh, another EUA, and do doses to be pushed um, quickly. Uh, so the bottom line is this, is, this is a technology to be uh, marveled at and excited about, not to be feared. Uh, this, is, this technology wasn't brand new just for COVID. This is a technology that's uh, there's been a lot of interest in. And in fact, other clinical trials looking at this uh, for Zika virus, cytomegalovirus, um, and even some cancer therapies. So this isn't just brand new, pulled off the shelf, hey, let's just try plugging and playing here. This has been technology that has been uh, thought of in the molecular world as being a very viable and frankly, maybe a better way to do vaccinations than our standard way. And so what the slide here shows is simply uh, and, and I tell you what, I, I would uh, be happy never hear the word spike protein again, but so the spike protein that is on the coronavirus is how it really invades our cells. And so with that, they were able to isolate that genome very, very quickly. You know, I'll say historically in the 1918 pandemic, it took them years to even identify what was causing that. It was thought to be a bacteria for years. Here we identified the virus quickly, sequenced it in particular parts of it, like the spike protein, and then we could take this technology out there called mRNA, which is essentially a code using our body's own system to, to generate its own pieces of spike protein that then go out into the cells and our body see that at foreign, so they generate an immune response, antibodies and, and T cells. And, and then what happens is when that virus, when we're faced with that virus, that spike protein is crucial to its infection. We've already got the antibodies and the, and the immune cells to this, and so it prevents getting infection, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. So um, really, uh, technology that's um, uh, not, not new, but was very effective for this uh, vaccination, as we've seen. Uh, and on the next slide, what you'll see is um, uh, kind of symptoms or, or safety. Uh, so in the, in the trial, which was, you know, 44,000 uh, people, and again, you know, I talk about the Moderna trial, that data is going to be publicly available as well. Uh, really, the most common thing was um, arm pain. I have to say, I haven't noticed any yet, but a large number of people noticed mild arm pain. That's, you know, not a big deal to me. Uh, and then as far as sim uh, systemic symptoms, a little more common after the second dose, uh, but mostly uh, mild, you know, things like uh, uh, low-grade fever, muscle aches, um, and usually uh, will occur within the first 48 hours and be gone within the first one or two days. So that's what the large trial uh, showed. And then very few serious advents of adverse events, and I'm talking about the entire trial. There were no concerning adverse events as far as, you know, uh, signals to suggest that there was something more common with the vaccination as far as um, 
serious you know, hospitalizations and so forth. I mean, obviously that happens at a regular rate in the, in the public anyway, and so there's no, no concerning differences between the placebo group and the, and the vaccinated group. And no deaths uh, that were felt to be related to the, to the vaccination. There were six deaths in the trial and uh, uh, only two of them in the vaccination group. Um, and then on the next slide, I think this really displays uh, the question of efficacy. Does this virus work? And so if you look down at the, um, on the, on the y-axis, that's cumulative incidence of cases, and then across the uh, x-axis is uh, days. So day zero is that first dose. So we know this is a two-shot series. You get it day one, or I mean day zero, and then 21 days uh, later. And so what you can see is that first seven days after vaccination, similar rising incidence, and then the blue line is the vaccinated group, the red line is the is those uh, in the placebo arm. And you can see that curve separating after seven days uh, pretty uh, extensively. And if you just drill down on the data, after one shot uh, post, uh, before the, the second shot, it's about a 52% uh, efficacy at reducing symptomatic infections. When you look at the final analysis uh, that they did, uh, it's over 90%, 94% uh, effective um, when you when you go out, especially past seven days from the second shot. And so one point is you already get effect from an, a protection after the first dose, but you really get most substantial in, uh, protection. I mean, the FDA set the bar at 50% uh, that they were looking at for a vaccination to be approved. So this is 94% effective at the, at the second dose. And again, very safe uh, fr from what we see. Uh, and then on the next slide, um, some special considerations that uh, get asked about. So uh, pregnancy or planning pregnancy. So, um, you know, in trials like this, pregnancy is excluded, but pregnancies do happen. Uh, and there wasn't a large number in this, but certainly the ones they have uh, did not show any safety concerns. Uh, there isn't anything mechanistically, this is not a live virus to, to uh, have any concerns at this point from a pregnancy standpoint. And so what has been recommended, and I spoke with uh, uh, one of our um, expert uh, neonata or, uh, ne uh, internal fetal medicine um, specialist, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Byers, uh, yesterday evening about his opinion on this. And so what's currently being recommended is that pregnancy should not be excluded from this vaccination. Everybody has to make an informed assent, talk to their physician, but both the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine has come out saying that if a female is in that group, in that phase that's recommended, so right now we're doing healthcare workers, long-term care, if they're in that group, the vaccination should be given to them if they so uh, choose, and hopefully people will. Same, same thing with breastfeeding, nothing to be uh, concerned about from the, from the data or any mechanistic reasons why it wouldn't be safe in breastfeeding. But again, everybody has to make their own uh, decisions on that, but it appears to be uh, appropriate. Immunosuppression, uh, so again, not a live virus, so there's no evidence for adverse effects from this. So this, patients that are on immunosuppressed medications, this is recommended because they are at higher risk. And I'll go back to, we do know that uh, pregnancy has complications with COVID infection. So the benefits of vaccination uh, would appear to outweigh those, uh, the, the risks. So same thing with uh, immunosuppression. Age for vaccination, most of us thought that they would approve it for 18 and older. Uh, but um, interestingly, on the FDA panel, uh, which had a number of pediatricians, uh, there were about 153 patients between the ages of 16 and 18 in the trial, uh, so not a lot, but they felt strongly that a 16-year-old is more like an 18-year-old than a 14-year-old or a 12-year-old, and based on what they saw, they felt very comfortable recommending it for ages 16 and above. And then... Uh, the other thing that comes up is, uh, oh, and I will say too, some of the efficacy uh, effect, it, it, it holds through all age groups uh, when, they, when they analyze the data. Uh, the other question that comes up is window for the second shot. So what, you know, we're still learning about this. You can get it as early as 17 days after the first shot. Uh, and currently the recommendation is get it as close to the 21 day mark as you can. If you go past that, get it as quickly as you can, but you don't have to restart the series. We will you know, continue to learn about that and that guidance could change, we'll have to see. Um, and then what about individuals who already have COVID? So the recommendation is regardless if you have had COVID, then you should still get a vaccination. One option as you know, we realize you know, how many doses we have and we don't know exactly how quick we're gonna continue to get reshipment. If you've had infection within the past 90 days, there's the option of foregoing the vaccination. Uh, to save doses for, for somebody who has not had the infection. And so that option is out there. 
And then allergies, uh, again, lots of you know, uh, news regarding um, the UK's experience, and they had a couple allergic reactions. What we can say is that, uh, in general, allergies uh, are not a contraindication unless you have had significant allergies, in particular to injectable medications. And one thing I'll say that, you know, we've got 44,000 people in this trial. There will be continued safety monitoring. When I got my vaccination yesterday, I signed up for a program called vSafe through the CDC, where they will uh, continue uh, to send me some questions that I'll answer saying how I'm feeling and if I'm noticing anything. So there'll be ongoing safety monitoring that, that will happen even post uh, trial with this. Uh, and so um, we, we have not seen anything. There was nothing in the trial concerning for allergies in general. Uh, but if you have a history of anaphylaxis in particular uh, related to injectable medications, uh, certainly we would want uh, you to see your physician to see uh, whether the vaccination is, is a right for you. And then on the next slide, um, I just wanted to show, you know, here's the active ingredients. Uh, so this goes back to my next slide that I'll show with regarding to myths. But, you know, I'll point out here the predominant thing is this, uh, this mRNA, and then it's surrounded for stability uh, in kind of a lipid coat. So you see the, the lipids there, and then the salts that are, you know, kind of made up, and then sucrose, which is sugar. So nothing weird here, no, no metals, no aluminum, uh, no uh, microchip. Nothing there, uh, just you know, basic uh, in ingredients. We think maybe the allergic part of it in patients who are prone to it because it's in other things is the polyethylene glycol component to this. Again, we'll, we'll learn more about that as, as uh, time goes here and, and we have more people vaccinated. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to just cover a few myths on, on vaccination. So, um, uh, and it, it's kind of interesting to me, uh, you know, social media, uh, the, the number of people who will buy into things on social media but won't trust uh, trusted experts who, um, uh, you know, have been looking at this for a long time, studying it. Science doesn't, doesn't lie, uh, but social media can. And so I think it's really important when you're, you know, if you're in the mode of trust but verify, I mean, pick the right way you're verifying things. I would advise against uh, the use of uh, unvetted social media posts, but this, can it alter the DNA? An mRNA does not get into the, the nucleus where our DNA resides. Uh, it is in the cytoplasm. And so what happens is it tells your body to make this protein, translate this protein, that's the spike protein, so it does not alter the DNA whatsoever. Um, second thing that's going out there on uh, social media um, is infertility. Uh, there is nothing in this vaccination, and I'm pretty sure the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology would not have recommended this vaccination if there was concern for infer inf uh, infertility. And so, again, this was an example of one little question about the uh, one protein that has to do with the placental formation being similar to the spike protein, and it's, and it's, it's really uh, not. I don't want to go into a lot of um, complicated molecular biology detail on this, but I can tell you there's nothing about this vaccination that would make us uh, worry about infertility. Uh, and if there was, the infection uh, would also put you at risk for infertility. Um, so uh, we'll see. There's a tracker in this uh, vaccination, absolutely not. I don't know if people are just wrapped up in the fact that the shipping has a tracker so that we know where it's going, where it's at, it can be tracked. There's nothing in that ingredients that you saw on the previous slide that has a, has a tracker there. Uh, it it uh, makes you an antenna for 5G. Uh, that's probably one of the m most uh, comical ones that I've seen out there. No metals in there. There is nothing in there that's going to be 5G related, I promise. Um, it causes Bell's palsy. So there were four patients in the vaccination group that got Bell's palsy, which is a kind of a weakness paralysis of the facial nerve, uh, and none in the placebo group. Those four out of the 22,000 in the, in the vaccination arm is not beyond the normal uh, rate of Bell's palsy in a population. The analogy I would use, if you flipped a coin four times, you could get heads four times. So this is a matter of, of chance. So it was not statistically significant. Uh, if, you, if we had 22,000 people go out and sing the Nebraska fight song on O Street over the ensuing two months, four of them could get Bell's palsy. And I don't think it would be because they were singing the Nebraska fight song. Uh, so, that, so that will be another thing that continues to be monitored. We will see if anything, you know, comes out from a signal from there, but there is nothing at this point to, to make us worried that that is related to the vaccination. Uh, and then again, I talked about this in the first slide. This is not technology that was just immediately put together for COVID. This existed. This is, a, you know, an example of innovativeness 
uh, and something we should be proud of, not to be, not, not to be feared, uh, because this, frankly, is a, a vaccination that I think we'll see used for other things in the future because of this technology, because of, of a lot of those advantages, the, the ramping up of, of, uh, of the uh, uh, ability to make a vaccination quickly and, and safely for different things. Um, and then I think the other, uh, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so just a couple of final thoughts. Uh, one of the important things is going to be for us as uh, healthcare professionals, you know, we're leading the way in getting the vaccination. Uh, and so, you know, the old saying goes, vaccines do not save lives, vaccinations do. So, you know, one of the greatest public health uh, developments through our history is, is uh, vaccinations. Uh, but if people wouldn't have taken the smallpox vaccination, the MMR vaccination, the polio vaccination, they would have had no effect. So we have to have people willing to be, to be vaccinated for this to have an effect. If you look at the efficacy of this vaccination and what looks like Moderna uh, vaccination, uh, roughly 60 to maybe 70% of our population would be vaccinated and, and we'd get to herd immunity. Um, I will say, I think it's really important, like I said, the tunnel's still long. So I am excited about this vaccination. I've got the first one. You know, going to get the second dose in, in 21 days, um, but this virus is still out there. It doesn't care that we're starting vaccination, so we have to stay diligent. We have to follow all of those same things uh, until we feel, you know, comfortable that we that we have the pandemic under control. And again, I commend our community for for doing that uh, over the past uh, several weeks. Um, vaccination will, in my opinion, be the safest way for us to reach herd immunity. Again, a lot of reasons we get vaccinations. We, you know, we weren't seeing much in the way of measles because people were vaccinated. Uh, again, that's that herd immunity. So I'm getting the vaccination, I'm low risk, but you get the vaccination for the good of society and that's gonna be really important. And so um, uh, w w this will be the safest way if we don't want uh, you know, to reach a million deaths in this country, uh, vaccination will be the way that we can prevent that uh, just besides the other things that we're already doing. And then I would just say, uh, you know, we should be proud as a uh, community, as a country, for what we've accomplished uh, uh, in the face of this, uh, um, you know, fierce enemy. Uh, we can't let up. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, there were, um, you know, one of, one of the things are certainly criticisms about uh, how the government handled the testing and PPE supply. And, you know, of course, you can always, you know, second guess things, but one of the things that was done right was this vaccination. The reason that we've been able to go so quickly wasn't cutting any corners, it was the efforts on multiple lines to work in parallel uh, for not only, you know, normally vaccinations, you, you know, there's tri you know, low grade trials, phase one trials, and then phase two, and then phase three, and no company is gonna move on from a phase one trial till they see what happens or production until they see what happens. But there was infrastructure in place basically uh, for us, uh, for the companies, uh, for the, in combination with the, the uh, government to move these things in parallel so that as soon as, uh, if it was shown to be effective, it could be immediately uh, made available to us. Uh, and so um, I think it's something to be proud of and, and I'm certainly proud of everything uh, we've done here at, at Bryan. Uh, to hold, you know, to, to hold this in check the best we can. Now that we have a vaccination, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and I, and I really hope, I hope everybody uh, feels, you know, comfortable with regards to, uh, to, to this um, uh, vaccination and others that are, that'll come out and we'll, you know, have to vet them as they, as they come out, just like we did uh, this one. Um, you know, one of my <clears throat> favorite uh, quotes is from the uh, movie uh, Miracle and, and uh, um, you know, great, great moments are born from great opportunities. And so we have a, we have a, a moment here with regards to this pandemic uh, that's giving us a great opportunity and the way we capitalize on that is to, uh, is to feel comfortable that this is, um, this is one of the ways we can end this. Thanks, Bob. The uh, vaccination process has gone very well. I think yesterday we completed the day over 450 individuals getting vaccinated. Uh, today we will probably use the rest of the doses that we had received yesterday. We are anticipating some additional doses coming in tomorrow, but we really don't count on that till it's physically in our possession. 
Uh, we have heard no issues of side effects at all. Um, we're just very proud of the team and what they've done in pre preparation for this. So I think people were aware that uh, from a state perspective, they allowed hospitals to begin elective surgeries again. Uh, we as an organization uh, have taken a deep look at it and we have opened up some of our elective surgeries. The ones we have not opened up yet are ones that require a two day length of stay and also ones that typically would require an ICU stay. And the purpose of that being is our ICUs are still extremely busy. Um, so we want to make sure we're, we're being very prudent before we just open up all elective surgeries. We have also looked at cases that require large amounts of blood being infused. And the purpose of that being, if you hadn't heard, uh, there's been a shortage of some blood supply. So we're still being very cautious and as time goes on and we notice that we have some additional capacity in our ICU or blood becomes more available, then we will open up more elective surgeries. really exciting. Um, it's almost even a little emotional. Just we've been on this journey for so long and just to feel like we're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm excited to do my part and get the vaccine. And I'm definitely going to tell all of my family and friends. Um, it was painless. It was a great experience and I highly recommend it. It's just a refreshing day, really. Um, to be even able to have this opportunity. I, I feel so fortunate that Brian has given us this opportunity to have the vaccination. It's phenomenal. Try not to cry, um, but uh, it's a great day. And uh, today is the beginning of the end of this.